Hello, welcome to my studio and welcome to another edition of Art Success with me, Adelaide Demoa. Today I'm going to be interviewing Ben Tallon. Ben is a professional illustrator and he's based here at Second Floor Studios over at the Telegraph building. And he actually graduated in 2006 with a degree in illustration from a university in Preston. He then went on to do temping work as you do after he graduated from university uh, for about a year. By the time he got to the end of that year then he had built up enough of his portfolio to enable him to start doing freelance work. While he was doing this freelance work, he grew increasingly frustrated with the lack of work that was out there. He just felt like he wasn't getting any work and he was getting frustrated with keeping on seeing people constantly posting all the great commissions they were getting. So he started a blog and on that blog he started to rant and he ranted quite seriously. And all of that ranting led to illustration community getting behind him and showing him a lot of support for what he was doing. And that support grew to the extent that he was able to utilise the material that he had from his blog to then go on to write a book called Champagne and Wax Crayons. Uh, somewhere in between that, he managed to secure an exclusive contract with an agency called Illustration Limited. Which brings us right up to date. He's based here at Second Floor Studios and he works full time as a professional illustrator and he's had lots of fantastic and amazing clients including the world. No, I'm not going to spoil it. <laughs> ben actually did give me a copy of his book which he signed because I got it like that. But if you would like a copy yourself please do come down to Second Floor Studios and have a chat with him for yourself. For now let's get into the interview. I read that you came across some issues and then therefore started writing a blog about the issues that you faced, which then led to the book, mm. which is called... Champagne and Wax Crayons, Champagne. Riding the Madness of the Creative Industries, that's the full title. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Champagne and Wax Crayons. Champagne and Wax yeah. Crayons, I quite like that title. <laughs> I can't take credit for it, my editor came up with that. Was write, you writing that blog, was that a way of you coping with the, the kind of issues that you were facing? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I'd been I'd been doing all right for a couple of years. I'd, mm. I'd earned well enough living in Manchester, enjoying myself for a couple of years. And I travelled to New Zealand and Australia for a six, seven month period. Mm. And I kind of rested on my laurels a little bit in the sense that I was just working with my regulars. And when I came back, because I'd not promoted, because I wanted to kind of enjoy the balance of being able to travel around and still make money. Five or six regulars dropped off in like a one month spell. Wow. So it really cut the main body of my work from under me and I was really kind of on the breadline and bottom of my overdraft just kind of clawing by on scraps and I, I found it really frustrating that I'd come so far and or at least I felt like I'd come so far and suddenly it was it was kind of gone and you know I'm rattling around my flat just emailing everyone and nothing's given and I set up this blog to kind of have a bit of a rant about that and oh, everyone likes to paint a pretty picture on social media about what cool jobs they're doing but I wanted to highlight the fact that everyone that I knew that I'd spoken to was was all in the shit and kind of struggling in their own way and all had the pressures that we all have as creative professionals and I didn't feel like anyone was really talking about that in a really honest manner so that's what I wanted to do and I didn't expect anyone to connect with it but a number of people did to the point where there was one really kind of angry rant of a blog that I put on there and one lad kind of emailed me privately going I'm loving all your stuff but I'm just checking that you're all right like, <laughs> that last one was a little bit you oh. seem a little bit on edge and I was just like I'm all right I'm all right I'm just I'm getting a better grasp on really maximizing the kind of impact of the writing <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah one thing led to another and as, as things work in our world um, I met the right people and found a connection at Lid Publishing who uh, bought into the idea of this book and offered me a deal. Could you tell me a bit more about the most challenging thing that you faced in, in, in that period of time and how you overcame it? I think self-belief is everything in self-confidence. I think when you're firing all cylinders and you're feeling good, I don't know what it is that you put out there, but there's something that I think opens doors in the way that negative, you know, negativity breeds more negativity and positivity you know does the same thing I really I really believe in that and I think that it's very easy to get caught up in that negative mindset when you're not getting the work through or things aren't perfect and then you kind of stop seeing opportunities at some point mm. that's what I feel and I really thought that you know when you go six weeks without getting a job you think and you're looking online and you see everyone posting these cool commissions it's kind of soul destroying and you, you feel like you're that far down the pecking order that it's never going to come back around so I think staying motivated and staying Confident is really hard and something that everyone finds challenging. 
at least everyone I've spoken to, you know, I, I meet guys that have been in the industry for 30 years. Yeah. And they're still worried about where next week's work's coming from, yeah. you know, which is both encouraging and daunting. It depends how much you want it. That's enough to break some people completely. Yeah. For others, it's kind of like, well, actually, we've got something in common there, and these guys are doing amazing things, so I can do it. So I, I really think self-motivation and self-belief is probably the biggest challenge when you're going through times like that. It's very easy to get knocked and start thinking, actually, you're not that good. Yeah. And maybe you should be doing, maybe you should be getting a proper job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Back to your illustration agency, Illustration Limited. How did that come about? I'd been knocking on the door of a number of illustration agents for some time, like six months, maybe even a year. And at the time when I was in Preston, uh, Danny Ellison, who's a good friend of mine and he's an illustrator and photographer, he graduated the year before me. We ended up sharing a studio together. And, um, and Danny was great because he, he passed down so much great advice and, and just having another illustrator, seeing someone who was actually getting paid work, like over, only a partition wall away from me was invaluable and really gave me good com- you know, some strong confidence. But Danny was signed to Illustration Limited at the time, so he was he put in a good. He saw me start to develop, and he put in a good word with the agency. And it took about a few months more after that, but eventually they offered me a place. I guess my I kept sending updates of my work once every few weeks, and I suppose I reached a level where they saw something in that that was marketable and offered me a position. And it took time to develop. It took a couple of years before we saw any regularity of work, and I was still in the process of shaping my brand and my portfolio, but. They were great and they showed me a lot of patience and a lot of willingness to, to help me you know, with feedback on the style and give me input from a level of expertise that I didn't have access to otherwise. And we've got a really strong relationship now and you know, they're one of the biggest well-represented agencies in the world so it's a really good place to be. And that's an exclusive relationship that you have with them? It is, yeah, they're worldwide so you, know, you get some illustrators who will be represented with a separate agent in America for example or in Australia but... Uh, Illustration Limited have got a really good outreach. They're in New York and in Paris and Shanghai and all over the world. So um, that's great. It means that you know I've always got one point of contact with the guys who work there, and it's all good. Yeah. So it was worthwhile you knocking on the doors of illustration companies, or would you say it was more because of the relationship that you had with your friend who? then pointed you in there. I think it counted for a lot. Uh, Danny's got a really good relationship with the agency Mm. and it's not a jobs for the boys type thing but it's more that Danny's endorsement of me gave it that crucial personal inroad. You know, they they listened to Danny and actually took the time to take a look. And even so, you know, I mean, I I recommended numerous illustrators that have not been taken on the agency so it doesn't always kind of work like that and Mm. I guess I had to fit into their brand, I suppose, but at the same time I had to offer something that wasn't treading on any of the other, other illustrators' toes, and I, you know, provided something new for the agency, really a different, a different market, maybe. The fact that they didn't take me on for a good six months to a year after they got the recommendation says that I wasn't ready at the time, and they were willing to, to wait, you know, because, um, God, you know, I, I don't know what they would have done with me at that earlier stage, but I think they picked me up at the right time, you know. And I guess we all felt like I was starting to find a, a recognisable style that they could, they could market. Yeah. When I'm speaking to more and more artists, regardless of what their discipline is, in terms of whether it's getting um, gallery representation, in your case, uh, an illustration agency, the one thing that everybody has in common is networking, Mm. saying that it's networking that's the most important thing, getting to know other people in your field. And that doesn't mean that a place is guaranteed, but it means that it's an easier road in than you just knocking on the door and saying... Of course it is. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, let's face it, what has shown me a business in the world that isn't built on relationships and networks, of course, a recommendation is golden, especially in an industry like the arts where people do trust. There are so many flaky people who can't deliver a job on time, so a recommendation from someone that's trusted goes a hell of a long way and and really jumps the queue, so to speak. Yeah. Um, I'm a huge advocate of it you know since I've moved to London one of the biggest benefits of being here is the fact that you can walk into a pub and meet the right person if you know how kind of thing you know and I mean within weeks of moving down here I've been connected with Andrew Cottrell who is a a really well-known music photographer and I loved his work just so happened that my friend used to commission him at the big issue for photo shoots and front covers and stuff that recommendation you know, now means that we're doing a collaboration of over, over sort of 50 images with like you know, wow. world known, uh, world renowned musicians for an exhibition later this year. 
off the back of Andy, he introduces me to art directors at magazines, I help him out with similar inroads. That's the way the world works, you forge your network and I think the bigger that network is and, and the, you know, if you've got people skills, if you can be alright with people, it means that you're far likelier to be plugged into the latest opportunity or the latest opening, you know, that's just, that's just people, that's the, way, that's the way we operate. Yeah. What would you say was the thing that you're most proud of in your career to date? One achievement. There's a couple uh, to name. I always struggle with this because there's two angles. I always jump straight to the work for WWE, uh, the wrestling, because I just I grew up a wrestling fan in the 80s, and so did my brother and my best friend. And it's never gone away. When people challenge me on it, I say, "Oh, well, it's no different to EastEnders. It's still, you know, it's all <laughs> scripted, yeah, but it's just, you know, it is what it is." But I, I've gone to work for the company. You know, it's, it's that's my dream client, and I've gone on and done that, and that's. That wasn't, you know, you've, you always felt like that wasn't in the script. People don't do that, you know. You don't grow up believing that's ever going to happen. So to actually work for that company and have a relationship with them is still surreal to this day. So on a superficial personal level, I would say that. But I'm also very, very proud of charity work that I've done. I worked with a, a CAM, who are a male suicide charity. They're the only one who market exclusively at males. They, they work with, with any gender. But... There's a really sad statistic that uh, suicide is the biggest killer of young men between 18 and 40 in this country and they kind of really went for that and went, okay, look, they, they sort of really worked to break the stigma of that whole, oh, you know, men don't show emotion and all the nonsense that I guess we grew up with through the 70s and 80s and, you know, I guess my generation now we're starting to open up a little bit and they're really working with kind of the creative sectors to address that. So I came up with an idea for a campaign championing the emotional benefits of creativity and, and the connections you have from anything from being into the same band as your mate so you can go and watch a gig and talk or professionally you know working together with like-minded people and I've always had so much belonging in creativity and met amazing people that just make me happy um, that I felt you know I just felt really sad that people other guys didn't have that and didn't have a purpose or a belonging and felt a bit lost in the world so I pulled together this network of creatives and we were fortunate enough to somehow manage to interview people like Stephen Merchant and Danny Dyer, who you wouldn't expect to be in that realm, but he gave a really kind of heartfelt open on this interview about what it's done for him being an actor and things like that. And we really punched above our weight to pull that campaign together. And, you know, guys actually came up to us after that saying, through what you did and be able to go and talk to you and, and help out and be a part of that campaign. I now feel comfortable in saying that I've gone through times of feeling depression and we never knew this about these friends and, and people that weren't even friends just kind of would come up to us at gigs and start chatting and it turns out they've had troubles and they now felt like they could open up through that campaign and that was the, the most amazing feeling that I've had. I think easily the most rewarding feeling, you know, it's just to think that me sitting there with my ink pens in a studio can somehow create a vehicle for people to open up and share troubling issues is like mind-blowing to me, you know, and... I felt you know really inspired from that campaign and if you know if people can just choose their one little cause and help out through creativity then what a beautiful thing. How did you get in touch with that charity? How did that come about? Well when I was in Manchester I did a lot of work in the music industry. I set up a company with a close friend of mine who's called Dirty Freud, a musician and we set up a, basically a project supporting new music. I would do record covers and work on music videos and help support them in that fashion. And Danny would do writing and uh, work on, on tracks with them. And through that, we met a guy called Danny Keehan who had done a charity album for the same charity for Calm. They, they did a, a charity album all to raise money for the charity and that was the first time I'd heard of them. So they saw the work that we were doing and we all met up for a beer and had a chat. And they realised that we had a, a lot of things we could bring to the table for that cause. And I just thought, that's really interesting because I'd done a lot of different charity work over the years and I just thought this is a more, maybe a less shouted about cause. And I just felt as a guy who, who generally feels quite a happy person and content with the work that I'm doing and where my life's going I just felt really sad that there were you know millions of people who, who don't have that and just felt like with our skills that could be a really nice way to to apply them yeah and so I called them up and basically told them and said look I'd like to just come and chat with you and you know we came down to London and we've I've done many more things since and we've just we have a nice relationship you know and they do, they really kind of turn to musicians and sports personalities and other outlets like that to, to champion getting things out and talking about things. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Really nice. And then um, back to your other achievement, the WWE, how did that come about? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would always, you know, whenever I got free time, if I felt like my portfolio was in a good place or whatever, 
I'll just indulge and create some illustrations of wrestlers or whatever, or mock up some posters, you know, thinking that if I have this stuff in my portfolio, at least it's out there. Who knows? You know, they, there's got to be someone who, whose job it is to, to commission that work for the WWE. And as time progressed, I kind of became more frustrated that it hadn't happened. And I started then hunting for contacts. And eventually, you know, one of the people that I added on LinkedIn, who was a creative director at WWE, accepted my request and said, oh, I like your stuff, like, give me a call next week. So I called him up and it turns out he's from Bolton, um, you know, north of England and you know, straight away there's the Northern Connection and he's been in New York for 20 years working at Maxim magazine and all, it's a very decorated career. But just a lovely, humble, down to earth guy and you know, we, we had football in common, we had North of England in common. <laughs> so we started talking and we would start messaging each other about how rubbish our respective football teams were um, and just struck up a bit of a friendship and he said, look, you know, uh, be patient with me it's a corporate brand and it'll take time to even get anyone to pay attention to what you're doing but I really think it could fit with some of the things we're doing and true to his word he did about about six months later he commissioned me to do a portrait of the rock (laughs) wow (laughs) yeah and um, and that yeah and then you know we've we've then struck up a really good dynamic and and his experience has opened my eyes to lots of different ways of using my work so I've done set designs uh, for photo shoots I've done stuff for the website and he's really kind of helped develop me as a professional as well you know way beyond just the superficial commission for the company but you know we're, we're good friends now and we're always kind of sharing work and coming up with ideas and that's a really valuable relationship amazing mm. that's actually a really inspiring story yeah <laughs> it's like a childhood <laughs> dream come true it really is yeah it truly is and i don't think i've ever fully processed it you know it's one of those things that just always seems surreal yeah <laughs> oh last question mm. What advice would you give to any young people wishing to follow in your footsteps as a professional illustrator? Biggest piece of advice, and I always give this to anyone who gets in touch looking for advice, is is to not compromise on you. Keep searching for and championing what's unique about you. So if there's something that you go away and do in the evenings, for example, put it out there. Don't you know? Be, just put that into your work. You've got this unique unique journey through life, as we all have unique character set, sense of humour, people you've met, places you've seen. Try to ignore trends because trends come and go all the time and you'll be lost with them if you, if you start to become a trend yourself. Try to find something that's truly you and I think that will connect with a large number of people. So for, I know I always say like find your inner weirdo, you know, <laughs> and, and, and it's a beautiful thing. You know, when I see like a really quirky original project, I kind of get envious that it wasn't me that came up with that. But you can't because that's theirs and you have to find you so don't mimic and be unashamed about who you are and find a unique way of channel, you know, channeling that into whatever it is you do. It doesn't matter if you're a musician, a designer, an illustrator, but especially as an illustrator, it's a swamped market. There are so many good illustrators and it's very easy to look on portfolio websites and go, oh my God, I'm, I'm outnumbered by brilliant people, which we all are and we all feel that way. But just look at what makes the really successful people successful. They've found something that's unique and embodies their character. So retain that and hold dear to it. That's the biggest piece of advice I can give. Excellent, thank you (laughs) very much. Hi again, and thanks for joining me for that edition of Art Success with me, Adelaide Damoa and Ben Tallon. If you'd like to see his work, please do come down to Open Studios between the 2nd and the 5th of June, 2016. If you're watching it after that day, sorry. In the meantime, please don't hesitate to subscribe to my channel because by subscribing, you get immediate alerts whenever I post a new Art Success video or any of my art exhibition vlogs and studio vlogs. Thanks again for watching. Until next time, bye.